heterogeneous systems and electrochemical systems and how they can inform each other in catalyst design. And then I'll move on to some of our newer work on combining these systems with our enzymatic transformations. So hydrogen peroxide is an extremely um, important molecule. It's in one of the top 10 um, important industrial uh, chemicals. It's used in a wide variety of applications, mainly in paper bleaching, and more recently in selective oxidation chemistry. Um, it has a growing application in environmental remediation, such as water purification, um, as we go forward. Um, this is mainly due to hydrogen peroxide having a very high active oxygen content. Um, and the only byproduct of um, oxidation with hydrogen peroxide is water. So it can be an extremely clean and green um, chemical. Most applications industrially need between three and 10 uh, weight percent. And the annual production is around four, four million tons, but that's growing as the environmental sector and the chemical synthesis sector uh, grow for this molecule. Currently, most hydrogen peroxide is produced by this indirect anthroquinone method. So this relies on first the hydrogenation of an anthroquinone to the diol using usually a palladium catalyst and hydrogen. This molecule then undergo auto oxidation to release hydrogen peroxide as a byproduct. Now this process operates on an extremely large scale, it has many benefits such as it can operate at mild temperature. <clears throat> because of the stepwise nature, there's no direct contact between the oxygen and the hydrogen, so it's inherently safe. However, it's only economic on a very large scale. The anthroquinone needs to be um, replaced over time, and there's a high cost associated with extracting the hydrogen peroxide from these organic working solutions. The direct synthesis approach, either using heterogeneous catalysis by combining hydrogen and oxygen, or by electrocatalysis and doing oxygen reduction with protons and electrons, could provide a 100% atom efficient alternative. And this would be more viable at smaller scales, and a distributed model would remove the need for transportation. And you could envisage setting up smaller scale units on site for on-demand generation of hydrogen peroxide. However, both of these processes have their own drawbacks and their own characteristics. For example, the heterogeneous synthesis usually requires high pressures, requires you to mix hydrogen and oxygen, so you are always aware of the explosive limit. However, it can be made directly in water or alcohols as solvents. The electrocatalytic approach obviously doesn't require such high pressures, and there's no direct contact between hydrogen and oxygen. However, you need to get high rates to perform this in an electrolyte solution, which would need further extraction of a pure feed of hydrogen peroxide. Both of these processes have inherent um, problems, and the problem mainly comes from catalyst design and selectivity. So in the heterogeneous catalytic system, Catalysts which are active for the combination of hydrogen and oxygen into hydrogen peroxide are also tend to be active for the reaction of hydrogen peroxide with hydrogen to over hydrogenate all the way to water. In addition, these catalysts can be active for the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide and also the combustion of hydrogen and oxygen straight to water. In the electrocatalytic system, you want to avoid the four electron reduction of oxygen straight through to water. In both these systems, palladium is the most studied catalyst with the first patent was granted over a hundred years ago for the direct synthesis. However, palladium, as you will know, is an extremely effective hydrogenation catalyst 
towards both oxygen and hydrogen peroxide. And palladium also favors the four electron reduction of oxygen straight to water under acidic conditions. Many approaches have been taken to try and improve the um, selectivity of pure palladium catalysts. In the heterogeneous systems, this mainly focuses on adding promoters to the reaction solutions, such as um, mineral acids like nitric acid or HCl. This stabilizes the synthesized hydrogen peroxide. Also the addition of halides to selectively poison some of the palladium particles results in an increase in selectivity. Another approach um, to minimize the use of these um, promoters is to modify the surface of the palladium. And this has been extensively studied using polymers such as PVA and PVP. And more recently with some uh, phosphorus containing ligands um, added to the reaction solution. And this can um, help in a number of ways. It's thought to um, stop the back diffusion of hydrogen peroxide through the hydrophobic layer Around the, around the palladium particle, but also poison extended palladium surfaces to prevent the OO bond of oxygen or hydrogen peroxide from cleaving. Despite these challenges, a number of, um, a number of catalyst systems have been developed, which are able to show over 95% selectivity towards hydrogen peroxide from hydrogen and oxygen in the absence of acid and halide promoters. The first example was reported by Edwards um, in Science in 2009. And in this study, they were able to show that acid washing a carbon support material could lead to a very high distribution, um, a, a good dispersion of gold palladium particles on these surfaces which showed minimal activity towards over hydrogenation of hydrogen peroxide. And this was the first example of a catalyst showing this unprecedented selectivity. If we look at some of the structural features we know that the particles contain a lot of gold so there's a very good dispersion of particles so there's no very small palladium only particles and most of the palladium was present as palladium 2 plus in the catalyst. So more recently, some of the work that we did in Cardiff um, four or five years ago, we were able to develop a new class of catalyst supported on titania and silica. And these catalysts contain palladium with base metals such as tin, nickel, zinc, gallium or indium. So we had about five or six different examples and they were all able to achieve over 95% selectivity. This is quite impressive. I mean, you could, um, we show that there was no over hydrogenation of hydrogen peroxide, up to four weight percent hydrogen peroxide under 20 bar of 5% hydrogen. And we could recover 4% hydrogen peroxide at the end of the, the reaction. So this shows that the, the effect is not unique to gold and it's about controlling the um, speciation of the palladium. Now in these catalysts, the palladium was also in the palladium II oxidation state. The small palladium rich nanoparticles which were in this catalyst were encapsulated by these tin oxide layers, which you can see in this eels map here, which formed very neatly on the edges of our titania. And these oxide films contained low nuclearity palladium and the palladium was um, isolated in low nuclearity in larger palladium tin oxide uh, particles. So here we've got some hints of what might be the possible selective sites. At this point in our, in our studies of hydrogen peroxide, we took a slight sideways step and this was motivated by um, this proposal by uh, Flaherty, which was published in JAX um, two or three years ago. So in a very detailed kinetic study, it was proposed that the synthesis of hydrogen peroxide does not follow this Langurian type 
mechanism of purely surface, but it could actually be coupled electrochemical reactions. So on the same palladium particle, you could be facilitating hydrogen oxidation to protons and oxygen reduction using protons from the solution and the electrons which are generated from this hydrogen oxidation. And this was supported by demonstration that protons were required for the reaction. No Langmuir kinetic models would fit the experimental evidence. And so this got us to thinking, is it possible to identify any similarities between heterogeneous direct synthesis of hydrogen peroxide and electrocatalytic hydrogen peroxide synthesis using these well-studied gold palladium catalysts. And by doing this, we remove the need to activate hydrogen in the electrochemical system. So it gives us a new angle to study these materials. <coughs> so the first thing we did was prepare a range of materials by a sol immobilization method. And to do this, we take palladium and gold precursors. We add a polymer stabilizer in order to control the nanoparticle growth. And then we add a very strong reducing agent, such as sodium borohydride. This initiates the fast reduction and nucleation of nanoparticles, which then become capped by the uh, PVA polymer. At this point, we can then add a catalyst support material. So in this study, we added uh, Vulcan carbon XC72R, or we can use the colloidal solution directly um, as a catalyst. So as you can see below, um, we prepared a range of compositions of nanoparticles from gold rich to palladium rich. The particle sizes were fairly well controlled, determined by TEM, and the compositions of these particles were fairly well controlled, determined by both ICP and XPS. So testing these carbon supported particles under our direct synthesis um, conditions, I should just point out here what the typical conditions are for our direct synthesis experiments. So typically we use mixtures of alcohol and water as the solvent. And this is a balance between, um, on this basically just, we add the alcohol to control, uh, enhance, sorry, the um, solubility of the gases in the solution. We don't add any acid or halide promoters to our reactions. We conduct the reactions at very low temperatures, just above, just below ambient at two degrees C, high stirring and high pressures of um, gases, so around 40 bar in total, with a hydrogen to oxygen ratio of one to two and CO2 as a diluent in the to push us outside of the explosive regions. So as you can see, and I don't know if anybody's followed any of our past publications, but using this set of catalysts, we were able to see the well-studied um, uh, volcano plot, where we see a synergistic effect by adding palladium to gold, or gold to palladium. We see a peak activity around 50-50 composition, and this is by moles here. And what we tend to see is that the gold has very low hydrogen conversion, but quite high selectivity, which leads to a low net product productivity rate. <coughs> we see that palladium rich converts a lot of hydrogen, but has a much lower selectivity. And we see that the balance is usually somewhere in the middle. The balance between achieving conversion and selectivity gives you these observed volcano plots. And we wanted to see if this was true in an electrochemical system <coughs> as well as a heterogeneous system. So we took the exact same uh, colloidal solutions. So in this case, we are not supporting the particles onto carbon. In this case, we're taking the colloidal solution directly 
and dropping it onto an electrode. So we're taking a solution of gold palladium nanoparticles, dropping it onto an electrode tip of glassy carbon, and we're adding some binder and some IPA to help with the dispersions. <coughs> and the system we're using to study this is a rotating ring disc electrode. So this is an electrode, as you can tell by the name, which rotates. The catalysis we're interested in is happening on the um, carbon here. And this is surrounded by a platinum disc around the edge. <coughs> So the oxygen is being reduced on the electrode. The hydrogen peroxide, which is produced, is then being spun off the disc. And when it hits the platinum, this is then being oxidized. So we can monitor the oxidation current to determine how much peroxide we are making. Any water that we produce will not have an oxidation current when it hits the platinum. <coughs> Excuse me. So this lets us monitor the selectivity of our system. <coughs> so we performed a series of experiments using these catalysts with varying gold palladium compositions. In this figure here in the top left, you'll be able to see the, um, the ring currents or the disc currents actually. So this is the oxygen reduction currents. And as you can see, the palladium is the most active catalyst. So it has the lowest onset and reaches the highest current. <clears throat> so this is the most active, akin to converting the most hydrogen in the direct synthesis. And we can see a nice trend that as we go to gold, we're becoming less active, which matches what we observe in the direct synthesis in terms of hydrogen conversion. In terms of selectivity, we can see by monitoring the disk current here that once we go past the onset potential, which is um, these points on these um, traces here, we do start to detect hydrogen peroxide when we scan above and below and through the onset potentials. So all of these particles are making hydrogen peroxide in this system. <clears throat> By taking a combination of the current for oxygen reduction and the current for hydrogen peroxide detection, we were able to determine the selectivity of these samples. And as you can see, this matches quite nicely with the selectivity we observe in the direct synthesis of hydrogen peroxide. So palladium only has a very low selectivity, <coughs> around 5% towards hydrogen peroxide, and gold has a very high selectivity towards hydrogen peroxide. So we see similar trends, um, but the volcano curves that we see in direct synthesis are a result of a balance between conversion and selectivity. And this shows that we can learn from the electrocatalytic experiment and transfer this backwards and forwards to the direct synthesis. Now, bearing in mind that hydrogen activation is not a, a key factor in this set of experiments. And so this was all background and we wanted to learn how these alloys behaved um, in electrochemical situations. So when you're using bimetallic particles in these electrochemical situations, the stability of these alloys becomes very important. As each of the different metals has different oxidation potentials, will leach at different amounts. <coughs> and this is important because these high potentials will be experienced during start-stop cycles of any practical um, application of this. So we developed a few uh, what we call ADP, which are accelerated degradation protocols, to see how these particles would behave under much harsher conditions. So the first protocol, basically we scan through the oxygen reduction onset only up to around 0.8. The 
The second one, we go to a more oxidizing condition up to 1.2 volts. And the third protocol, we go up to a very oxidizing condition of 1.6 volts. And we linked up the electrochemical cell to an um, online ICP MS. And this lets us monitor the leaching of the catalyst in real time. And this was worked on in collaboration with the Max Planck Institute in Dusseldorf. So as you can see, we have here traces for the leached amount of palladium and gold in these systems. And when we're cycling the system to around 0.8, we're not getting any leaching of palladium or gold. When we go to 1.2, only the palladium is leaching from the particles. And when we go up to 1.6, we see the palladium and the gold start to leach from these nanoparticles. We then looked at characterizing these materials by microscopy, to see what the distribution of metals was becoming in these particles. And so here you can see some images and some EDS mapping of the, um, the particles in initially after cycling up to 0.8, where you see the particles remain roughly unchanged. <coughs> cycling up to 1.2, we can see maybe some palladium starting to come out of the particle. But cycling up to 1.6, we can now see the structure of these particles changes quite a lot. And the palladium remains mostly in the core of these nanoparticles. So we have a gold rich shell and a palladium rich core, which you can see by these mapping profiles that we recorded. And we can also monitor the amount of leaching of palladium by these EDS, these EDS maps. <clears throat> so we thought we'd then retest these catalyst systems to see how they perform in hydrogen peroxide synthesis with these slightly modified um, uh, structures. And what we saw is that as we start to take palladium out of the surface, the selectivity towards hydrogen peroxide began to increase. So initially the selectivity of this gold palladium particle was around 45%. But cycling up to 0.8, where we don't see any leaching, we again measured a selectivity of 45%. By starting to take some palladium out of the surface, going up to 1.2 volts, we had an increase to 70% selectivity. And then by disrupting the particle even more, we had a selectivity of around 85%. Now, this is not just passivating the particle with a gold surface, because the onset point for this reaction still remained lower than gold. So these particles were still more active than a gold only particle, but the selectivities were approaching very good um, selectivity. So we thought that this might start to suggest that having isolated or low nuclearity palladium in the surface of these particles would be selective catalysts for hydrogen peroxide synthesis. And this supports what we saw in the past with the gold palladium on carbon system, which was published in 2009, and also with the palladium tin and the palladium nickel systems that we reported in 2016. <laughs> so at this point, we decided, well, let's try and prove this hypothesis and move on to a, um, a model system. And the model system we decided to study was a single site palladium catalyst. So these are highly dispersed metals or atoms and they represent the limits of dispersion. And we've studied these um, for many years. Um, we've studied atomically dispersed gold on carbon. <clears throat> and this is a material that can be simply prepared by impregnating gold chloride from aqua regia onto a carbon support, followed by drying under nitrogen. Um, this is some of the microscopy that we've recorded on this material. <clears throat> More recently, we transferred this preparation um, in this paper in Nature Chemistry. We can show, we can transfer this into a system where we impregnate from a very simple organic solvent like acetone. So we can now have methods to readily prepare these materials. And so we made a material simply by switching the gold chloride for palladium chloride. 
And the material that we prepared um, had a lot of the characteristics that we were looking for. So it had cationic palladium species as determined by XPS. We see no extended palladium crystallites by XRD. And the microscopy shows that we don't have any nanoparticle structures in the catalyst. And this is a 1% loading palladium on carbon. Um, this scale bar here is 20 nanometers here. And then on zooming in further and further, we can see we've generated these isolated uh, metal species on the surface. This scale bar here is one nanometer. Gaining access to the synchrotron through the catalysis hub, we were able to compare this material to a number of um, palladium standards. And what we can see here on the right hand side by looking at the scattering paths um, and where the intensity is, just simply compared to these standards without any modeling, we can see that the palladium is not present as palladium oxide, which will be indicated by these red peaks here, or palladium metal, which would be indicated by these, these green, but it matches very, very closely with a palladium chloride isolated species with um, the bond distances, or the, sorry, the radial distance of the intensity being very close to a palladium chloride standard. And the fitting shows that these isolated palladium centers have a co chlorine coordination of around four. So we think it's a PDCL4 type um, species immobilized on the carbon. So we then tested these electrochemically in the same systems that we'd used before. And the first thing that we noticed is that these isolated palladium species, which we're calling this PDCLX on carbon, has very different electrochemical behavior compared to a palladium nanoparticle catalyst. So we don't see any of the features usually corresponding to bulk oxidation and reduction. And we ran a thousand CV cycles and these features don't begin to emerge. So this catalyst is not collapsing into palladium nanoparticles, even though we're cycling up to 1.6 volts and down to nearly zero volts. But strikingly, and this is one of the key results that we, that we want to report, is that when we compare the oxygen reduction activity of this catalyst to a palladium nanoparticle, they again show completely different behavior. So a palladium nanoparticle we see has a very low onset. So it's much more active, the palladium nanoparticle, than the palladium um, chloride species. But when we look at the selectivities towards hydrogen peroxide, the selectivity of this palladium nanoparticle catalyst is around 5% towards hydrogen peroxide. This makes 95% water, 5% hydrogen peroxide from all the oxygen that is reduced. Whereas the palladium chloride, the isolated palladium sites on carbon, have a selectivity to hydrogen peroxide of over 90% across the range. So just by changing the speciation of this palladium, we've managed to switch from 5% selectivity up to 90% selectivity towards hydrogen peroxide. And we wanted to show this because I think through the development of these catalysts and understanding the degradation mechanisms of these catalysts, we were able to identify some of these key structural features that we were aim for in a new material, such as cationic palladium, breaking of the palladium facets. And this to date is probably one of the most selective palladium only oxygen reduction catalysts that we've produced. And more interestingly, and this is the subject of our study at the moment, the material is still active for the reaction of hydrogen plus oxygen. So we're looking at mechanistic studies to work out how these single sites are able to activate hydrogen and oxygen at the same time. But they're also extremely selective for this reaction. So if we look at the degradation rates of aqua regia treated carbon 
we have 2%. We put the palladium on the carbon, it only goes up to 3%, but we can then make hydrogen peroxide using this system. So that's an example that I wanted to show you about some of our latest catalyst development towards uh, making hydrogen peroxide selectively and how we can learn from both electrochemical catalyst stability and identifying structural features in our old materials to generate this new um, material, which has many more levers to pull in terms of enhancing activity. Because now we're essentially working with a metal center with a ligand environment rather than a nanoparticle surface. So I've shown you it's quite difficult to design these catalysts to make high concentrations of hydrogen peroxide. So the next part of my talk, I want to show you how we can use low concentrations of hydrogen peroxide to facilitate chemical transformations. And one of the most challenging chemical transformations that we're looking at is CH activation. And this remains a great challenge in um, heterogeneous and homogeneous catalysis, despite having an abundance of feedstocks. And many of the problems are regioselectivity, so which CH to activate, controlling over oxidation, and minimizing the energy input needed to overcome these stable CH bonds. Commonly, these reactions are, in catalysis are radical based meaning that often conversion needs to be sacrificed for selectivity. One of the perfect catalysts to do this would be enzymes. And we've been working with this unspecific peroxygenase, which was isolated about 15 years ago from a fungus. And this is able to take hydrogen peroxide and selectively insert one of the oxygen atoms into the CH bond, producing only water as a byproduct. This, this enzyme is active in aqueous solutions and ambient temperatures, but it needs a constant feed of hydrogen peroxide. There's been many alternative approaches to feed this enzyme hydrogen peroxide. The first is to utilize enzymatic cascades. So for example, utilizing glucose oxidase to oxidize glucose to produce gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide. This process is um, not particularly efficient as you're only releasing one equivalent, uh, one reducing equivalent instead of um, all the reducing equivalents of glucose. You need to continually add the glucose slowly and also you need to then separate your gluconic acid from your reaction at the end. Cleaner cascades have been developed, such as this methanol cascade, which utilizes five enzymes to turn the methanol into CO2, but releases equivalents of hydrogen peroxide along the way. But then you need to control a complicated cascade of five enzymes. Heterogeneous approaches have been studied, such as electrochemical production of hydrogen peroxide, However, this can cause a lot of oxidative damage to the enzyme. And more recently, a titania-based photocatalyst was used to produce hydrogen peroxide to feed this enzyme in one pot. So we wanted to combine our hydrogen peroxide technology with this biocascade. And one of the things we have to be aware of is the big difference in the reaction conditions needed Typically, we're working at high pressure, low temperature, high stirring speeds, and with um, reaction mixtures that contain um, various contents of hydrogen. Biocatalysis typically refer works to atmospheric pressure, ambient temperature. Enzymes typically don't like high shear stirring forces and their pH controlled conditions. But crucially, this enzyme only needs around 50 ppms of hydrogen peroxide. So we reasoned that our catalyst might be active enough at these very unfavorable conditions to feed the ppms of hydrogen peroxide. And so we tested our gold palladium catalyst systems under these conditions. So we simply took a buffered solution, 
a phosphate buffered solution at pH 7, room temperature, and bubbled through hydrogen in air. And we were able to detect, depending on the catalyst loadings, that we were preparing PPMs of hydrogen peroxide. And this could be a very clean delivery system because your reactants are gases and your only byproduct is water. So you can carry out the enzymatic transformation extremely cleanly. The next thing we checked is whether our catalyst would work being shaken or stirred and whether this would affect the enzyme. And what we did is combined the glucose oxidized, glucose oxidase system with shaking, stirring, where we saw a slight reduction. And then we added our titania catalyst to this and we saw no detriment in the activity of this PADA1 peroxidase in this system. So our gold plating titania catalyst is not affecting the enzyme in any great way. We then coupled the whole system together. So we took a range of our gold palladium catalysts, fed them hydrogen oxygen in an aqueous solution at ambient temperature, ambient pressure, in the presence of the peroxidase enzyme and cyclohexane. And in almost all the cases that we tried, we were able to detect cyclohexanol as a product. And we did lots of control experiments to prove that this wasn't coming from the metal catalyst, the presence of hydrogen peroxide alone as a background reaction. What we were able to then prove is that we could couple these processes together. <laughs> Compared to some of the other systems, we had a much more stable hydrogen peroxide delivery system because the glucose oxidase is actually denatured and deactivated by high concentrations of gluconic acid, which change the pH of your working solution, also high concentrations of peroxide, and can also suffer from inhibition from the substrates. By taking this first enzymatic process out, we were able to create a much more stable hydrogen peroxide delivery system. And you can see after four hours comparing the heterogeneous bio system to the bio bio system, we had very similar activity. And this again reinforces that the presence of the heterogeneous catalyst is not destroying the activity of the peroxidase. So this allowed us to then start running much longer reactions with these two catalyst systems combined. And what we were able to show starting from a, a 10 millimolar concentration of uh, cyclohexane, we were able to generate cyclohexanol over 16 hours with very little over oxidation to cyclohexanone. And so uh, it's not on this graph actually, but this represents full conversion of the cyclohexane that we, um, we put into the reaction. We then started to extend the substrate scope. So we then take ethyl benzene and over 16 hours, we can convert the ethyl benzene selectively into one, one phenyl ethanol with very little over oxidation to acetophenone. So we have very selective CH activation, very stable activity. But one of the other real benefits of enzymatic systems is that you're able to install chirality into molecules. And so we analyzed the one phenyl ethanol that we were producing. So this is racemic one phenyl ethanol, a standard of one of the enantiomers of one phenyl ethanol. And during our six hour hydroxylation reaction, we were still able to achieve an EE of over 98% towards the phenyl, our phenyl ethanol. And this is very nice because it shows that the presence of the heterogeneous catalyst is not any detriment to the amazing properties of the enzyme in being able to install chirality into these molecules. We extended the substrate scope a little bit further into more complex terpene type molecules, such as isoferone, which is used in the, the fragrance industry. 
And what we could see is the enzyme and the combined system could very selectively install the oxygen atom either at this position or at this position. And this is the inherent selectivity of the enzyme is why we produce two products. So we were able to transform a whole range of these molecules, selectively oxidizing them, cyclopropane and the tetralin molecule we were able to incorporate as well. And in the, both the cases of um, ethyl pro, uh, benzyl propane and tetralin, we were again able to install um, chirality into this position. So here's the standard racemic molecule and here's the uh, molecule from our reaction. The same with the tetralin, we were able to produce just the R enantiomer. And this really opens up a new way of um, integrating heterogeneous catalysts into biocatalytic processes where you combine the best of both worlds. So in this process, we're doing a very, very clean transformation by producing hydrogen peroxide. But our catalysts are also active for a range of other transformations. So you can think about starting to build even more complicated reaction cascades. So our gold palladium nanoparticles are active hydrogenation and oxidation catalysts in their own right. So starting from a molecule such as styrene, you could first hydrogenate the molecule and then install the OH to produce this alcohol. If you're able to get the combined enzymatic system to act first, you could generate epoxides and you can then open this epoxide using the same catalyst to produce the terminal alcohol from the same molecule. So this is where we're working at the moment. So we're working on these more complicated cascades and this boils down to catalyst design. So it boils down to, can we make a catalyst which can produce hydrogen peroxide, but not hydrogenate this double bond. And if we can do that, we can then access both alcohols from the same um, alkene. So that's where we are with this, with this study at the moment. So what I want to show you in the second half is that we've demonstrated that it's possible to take these hydrogen peroxide catalysts, put them under very harsh reaction conditions and still produce enough hydrogen peroxide to allow a range of chemical bioenzymatic transformations. We can maintain all the benefits of these UPO hydroxylations and really the source of the hydrogen peroxide does not affect the activity, regio or en enantio selectivity of the enzyme. And this represents a really easy scalable supply of low levels of hydrogen peroxide. So compared to the conditions that you would usually use to oxidize cyclohexane, this actually is one of our cyclohexane reactions with a few migs of our powder catalyst, some enzyme, some um, substrate, and we just bubble in hydrogen and oxygen and we are producing cyclohexanol in this class file. So that's where I wanna to finish today. I hope I've shown you some of the ranges of the things we can look at, looking at hydrogen peroxide, catalyst design, learning from other fields like electrochemistry, and then integrating um, catalysts that make hydrogen peroxide into biocatalytic transformations. And so there's a lot of people involved in all this work. So a lot of it was done with uh, Professor Graham Hutchings and Richard Lewis at Cardiff, um, the University of Cape Town, the University of the Free State in Bloemfontein. The enzymes were supplied by uh, Miguel from uh, Madrid, the CSIC in Madrid. All the electrochemistry was done in collaboration with the Max Planck Institute and Professor Meyerhofer's group. And I thank the Catalysis Hub for asking me to do the talk and for helping with access to the synchrotron um, to perform some of the um, XAFS experiments. So I'm happy to answer um, some questions. I know we covered quite a lot, but hopefully we can go into a bit more in the questions. So thank you. 
Thanks very much, Simon. That was a really interesting um, talk. So yeah, if you have any questions, just pop them in the Q&A box, uh, which is the bottom right box with uh, two speech bubbles above it. And um, Donny is going to help um, by reading out any questions that we get. Um, so yeah, just uh, fire away. The first question is uh, so from Simon Coran. The single atom catalyst is the chlorine ligand environment retained after reaction? Also, the classical question is what is the interaction of single PD cation with the carbon support? Is it important? Um, so, we've done some, we did the XAFs of the used um, catalyst after it had been exposed to high pressure hydrogen and oxygen and it was still still the same so it's still atomically dispersed the coordination numbers are still the same it's still a palladium palladium chloride again it's the classic question we don't know how these um, cations are immobilized on the carbon we can't find any other um, hints about the ligand environment um, at the moment um, yeah, so it's a classic question. We don't know how these things absorb. It's the same case with the gold, as you know. Every referee will ask that question, but we're not sure jo yet. Yeah. Jordi is asking, what is the support then for uh, used for palladium single atom catalyst? So the support we use is a, an activated carbon, um, a Norit activated carbon um, that's reported in the papers. Um, I can't remember the characteristics well, it's a high surface area activated carbon it's an extrudate that we crush um, back down into a powder before doing the, um, the measurements uh, i have a question myself yep uh, regarding the palladium chloride uh, during the modeling do you see any difference compared to a reference sample uh, what i mean is if you have the same chloride coordination you called your system PDCLX, but if you have two chloride there, because the X has told you have two chloride. Yeah, no, the, the XF shows us we have a chlorine coordination number of four, which matches the bulk structure of palladium oh, chloride. Yeah. yeah. So it's pretty much the same as the bulk material. Um, in terms of the first coordination shell, yes, but we don't see large agglomerates of palladium chloride in the system. Have you tried to just do the catalysis with just palladium chloride? Like the ball, the ball thing? Or um, so palladium chloride will have low activity towards this. Um, the problem with people have tried this before, but under the hydrogen, the palladium chloride reduces and then you form a colloidal particle in the, in the solution. So you have a kind of induction period while this palladium chloride reduces and then you're at left with nanoparticles at the end. Um, so this is a stabilized form of the palladium chloride, it seems. And it seems um, strangely stable to redox processes. So in the electrochemistry, we were scanning up to 1.6 volts down to zero across all the regions where you'd expect palladium to oxidize and reduce. Um, but yeah, we don't see it starting to collapse into nanoparticles. Right. Does temperature affect this uh, behavior? Sorry? Does temperature affect, affect this behavior or you haven't tested for that? Um, well, the hydrogen peroxide we've done is obviously at subambient conditions. On the nitrogen, we've taken it up to around 300 degrees and we don't see a collapse of the, the support. We don't see a collapse of the dispersion. I think it's stable to around 200, 250 under hydrogen. And okay. so we've done those experiments at Diamond with the in situ capability on B18. Simon is asking, so for the single atom catalyst, how to envisage hydrogen activation in the heterogeneous peroxide synthesis system? So I wish we knew that. Um, 
So obviously single palladium atoms can be active in hydrogenation reactions in homogeneous chemistry. So it can activate hydrogen. But one of the things we're actually starting to think is that it, it's not just one palladium site. So you could actually envisage two palladium sites which are connected electronically through the carbon support. So like the, um, maybe if I just share my screen again quickly. So similarly to this proposal, um, I guess you can see my screen again now. Yeah, I can see. Yeah. So similar to this proposal, where you have hydrogen oxidation and oxygen reduction happening on one palladium particle, and the particle conducts the electrons between the two processes, it could be possible that the two isolated palladium sites could be electronically connected by a carbon support. So one palladium site could be active for hydrogen oxidation, and one palladium site could be active for oxygen reduction. And electrochemically, we have shown that this catalyst is active for hydrogen oxidation, and it is active for oxygen reduction. And there are potential regions where both reactions could occur at the same time. So this is a working hypothesis, because we don't see any cluster formation, we don't see any bulk reduction to metal, and we don't see any sintering to nanoparticles in these systems. Uh, just a layman question now. Uh, I will try to use graphene instead of activated carbon. In theory, it should improve the, the concentration because it is. Yeah, it, I mean, it's a the theory. It it's a new investigation we've, we've talked about for a while is trying to control the carbon a little bit more. One of the things that's held us back a little bit is obviously we then have to optimize the preparation for every carbon that we use. Um, so it's actually a bigger task than simply, it's a bigger task than immobilizing nanoparticles on a range of different carbons. Um, well, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a way, way forward to, to probe this. The other way to probe it is to actually increase and decrease the loadings of the palladium. So on average, the sites would be closer and further apart and then to study the activity. How much is the, sorry, I missed this. How much is the loading on this catalyst? 1%. 1%, okay, thank you. Any more question? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I did a little bit. Okay, I guess if there's no more questions, um, I'd just like to thank Simon for his talk today and uh, Donato for reading questions for us. Um, and uh, I'm sure if you get in contact with Simon after, Afterwards, if you think of any questions, um, he'd be happy to, yeah. to get back to you. Um, our next webinar will be on the 17th of September. It's the Applied Catalysis Group um, webinar, and we'll have four speakers from the Applied Catalysis Group. Um, you can sign up via the Cat Hub website, um, the webinars page, and I'll just share that link now. Um, so yeah, you can sign up for most of the webinars then. So um, yeah, I'd like to just thank everyone for attending the webinar today and um, hope you all have a nice rest of the afternoon. I'll uh, leave it at that. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks.